Hey guys, Pastor Wes Pratt here from Northside Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining with us, watching this video uh, sermon or Bible study. We certainly want you to know that we're praying for you and with you as you study with us. We know that as we study God's Word, uh, God speaks to us. He draws us near and He changes things in our hearts and our minds. And sometimes we make decisions for Christ that we need someone to pray with or that we might need counsel. I want to invite you to go on to our website, www.northsideconroe.com. And under the contact section, you're going to find uh, our emails, our church phone number. You're going to find phone numbers for our deacons. We want you to know that we are here for you to pray with you to lead you through decisions that you may be making for Christ. So if you will contact us, we certainly want to talk with you, pray with you, counsel with you. As we enjoy this time of fellowship with the Lord together, I pray that God would speak to us. God bless. Good morning. Welcome to North South Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us on this special day. Today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Thank you so much for all you do, how you care for children, how you love on them, how you nurture them, how you teach them and lead them. Thank you. Today we honor you. Pray you have a blessed day. This morning we open up our worship service together. Join me as we read from Psalms chapter 47, verses 6 and 7. It says this. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King over all the earth. Praise Him with a song. As David wrote that, he encourages us, reminds us that we are to worship God. That's what we're created for. So as we sing together, let it flow. Praise the Lord, lift up His name, and sing to Him, your audience of one. Let's worship together. 
time in our worship service will take an offering. If you'd like to give to Northside Baptist Church, please go to our website at www.northsideconroe.com. There you'll find a giving tab on the far right. Click on it, and it will take you to a secure website where you can give to help support the ministries here at Northside Baptist Church. At this time, will you join me in time of prayer? Let's pray. Hey, God, thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for your healing power and the blood that was shed on the cross. God, there are so many people right now searching for answers. God, I pray that somebody today will find you, will find that answer and seeking you who can only be the one that can fill that empty void in our life. So God, this morning as we continue to worship together, may the words of the songs, may the scriptures that we read, may the preaching of the word touch someone's heart and lead them to realize, God, that they're lost without you and that they'll turn to you and ask your son Jesus to be Lord of their life. God, we can continue to pray for those who have either suffered through the coronavirus or going through it right now. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for joy in a time of, of hurt. God, we pray for the, the frontline workers, the, the nurses, the doctors, the policemen, the firemen, our leaders of our country. God, they need rest. They need strength. And we know you can provide. So God, I pray on their behalf and ask you just to touch their hearts individually right now. And God, let them know that there are people out there praying for them in this time of struggle. God, we need you now more than ever. I pray that we will all turn to you and realize that you can change everything if we just give our lives to you. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for all that you have done that we don't even recognize. Thank you for providing us the technology that we're using right now. For those who are on the stage playing the gifts that you have given them that we can lead others to your throne. Thank you, God. Lord, forgive us for we fail you. We ask all these things in your name. As we continue to worship together, Psalm chapter 59 and verse 16 says this, But as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in, dis in distress. I think we all can agree that COVID-19 has really distressed a lot of us. Not knowing what to do, how to handle things and all that. This morning I want to encourage you, if that is you, find the Bible. Open up God's Word and let Him speak to you through the words that He has written and given us to live by. His unfailing love is for everybody. All you have to be being willing just to step forward and say, God, I want to know more about you. And you too can hear, taste, and see and live out His unfailing grace. It is amazing. Let's worship together. 
our online service for Monday, uh, May 10th, 2020. I want to say Happy Mother's Day uh, to all of our mothers, especially my mom this morning. Uh, she and dad have been tuning in the last couple of weeks, uh, sending me some encouraging texts and emails and calls, uh, just saying that they're, they're tuning in. So Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. To all of our mothers, of course, uh, Happy Mother's Day. And I'm sorry that we were not able to have our church in church today, in service today. Mother's Day is one of my favorite Sundays, and I know it is yours too. We have a high attendance usually, and it's an opportunity uh, to tell our mothers and show our mothers how much we certainly uh, do love you and we appreciate you. However, there is good news. Uh, you heard the announcement this past week. If you are on our email list, we are going to be back in service in church next week, May 17th. If you do not have our email um, or you're not on our email list, uh, you can get that same information on our website at www.northsideconroe.com. Church members, you will receive an email tomorrow on Monday to explain how we're going to conduct our service on Sunday. As in the email, uh, we are going to have two services, one at 9 and one at 11, uh, to accommodate uh, our numbers following the current uh, social distancing uh, protocols. So look for that email tomorrow. Um, and for those of you who um, are not a member of our church, and members of our church, uh, please pray for us as we get back into our church. And of course, all churches as, as each one steps back into uh, their regular services or as regular as they can be, uh, we just wanna lift up uh, our church communities uh, as, we, as we regather. Uh, it's a great, great moment and opportunity, uh, but it does uh, require some flexibility, some understanding and of course, constant uh, prayer support. So thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, let us begin with prayer as we continue our series of messages this morning on the sovereignty of God. Pray with me. Lord God, as we do gather, I pray that you would lead us as we continue, Father, to study your sovereignty, the way your hand moves among us, the way that your will is done before us. I pray, Father, that you would teach us today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So take your Bibles this morning and turn to Isaiah chapter 45. This morning, we're going to transition uh, from salvation to suffering. We've been talking about the sovereignty of God as it pertains to salvation, and we've been now we'll, now we'll be talking about the salvation, I'm sorry, the sovereignty of God as it pertains uh, to suffering. As we thought about salvation, we learned that while Jesus did not explain everything fully to Nicodemus, Jesus called Nicodemus to believe by grace through faith. And Jesus would also lead us to recognize and believe that as God hand, God's hand is at work in our lives, that we need to also trust in faith God's work, God's sovereignty in our suffering, in our circumstances. And we see a story, we see an episode here in Isaiah chapter 45 that will help us today to understand this. This will be our title, Embrace Suffering Biblically, how do we recognize, how do we understand suffering? Well, if we think about it biblically, it may not necessarily be comfortable going through the suffering, but we'll be able to embrace it, worship God in it, trust him through it, and embrace the suffering biblically. So from Isaiah chapter 45, beginning with verse one, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. 
I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name and have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create, create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. So as we think about the sovereignty of God, and again, we've talked about this, we are okay when it comes to everything under the sun, when it comes to the sovereignty of God. God is all knowing, he's all powerful, he's all present. And as God moves and his will is done in every aspect of life, we worship him, we trust him, we know that he is in charge. But we've also made it known, and I think that we still wrestle with this from time to time, but when it comes to salvation and suffering, we still have some questions. We want to know fully why things happen the way they happen, and we want to have a little control in the things that we do. And so while we mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, while we still have some questions, we went through several messages as God's sovereignty pertains to salvation. And I pray that you were with us as we went through those lessons to recognize that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And God calls us simply to believe, to accept, and to trust him as he works in our lives. And so that's why we believe in faith. We don't have everything explained to us as we want it explained. God gives us enough know, though to know him and to trust him. So it's the same thing when it comes to suffering. We may not understand everything. We want everything explained to us. We want it palatable to us that we can understand it. However, if somehow God could explain everything to us fully, there's no way we would understand and would comprehend. You see, it would be similar to trying to teach a four-year-old calculus. You could use all the terms and the, and the definitions. You could talk about derivatives. You could talk about integrals. You could talk about all of those things. And a four-year-old, his capacity to understand would just not reach the level of intellect that it would require to understand calculus. It's the same with all of humanity when it comes to eternity. The four-year-old is having a hard enough time understanding shapes and colors and letters. He's still trying to learn how to tie his shoe. And we're the same way when it comes to our perspective of life or our understanding in life. There's no way we can understand and comprehend fully on God's level when it comes to salvation or suffering. We can barely figure things out enough as it is here on earth. So how would we be able to comprehend fully eternity? In fact, when it comes to suffering, the way we want to portray it or the way that we want to portray God is this way. We want to say, well, God is a good God. We want to talk about God's goodness. We want to talk about the love of God. We want to talk about God reigns supreme. He is sitting on his throne. He is in control and he reigns. And of course we can talk about those things and they are good to talk about, but how do we explain to someone that we're talking to about the God 
who we serve, who is a good God, who is a loving God, who is in charge, how do we explain to someone that he's good and he's loving and he's in charge even in the midst of our suffering? How do we explain or understand suffering? Well, there's three problematic questions that we ponder. The first is this. Does God have anything to do with our suffering? It's one thing that we ponder. It becomes problematic for us. A second question that we have is, how can a loving God permit this? If God is a, a God of love, if God is a good God, how can he permit this? And then a third problematic question that we wrestle with is, did God send this himself? Did he bestow this suffering upon, upon me? So if we do not correctly process suffering from a biblical truth, if we do not approach suffering from a biblical understanding, we then have a tendency to deflect from what the Bible says. In fact, we may even give Satan some credit when it comes to suffering. I'll give you an example. As we wrestle with those three questions that become problematic, here's then how we try to answer those questions. Does God allow this? Does God have a part of this? Did God send this? Does God have anything to do with this suffering? One of the ways we try to explain that is we say this, well, Satan is the one who creates the suffering. Or in effect, Satan is control of the bad things while God is in control of the good things. That may not necessarily be true at all. Or another way that we try to explain these three questions is that whoever is suffering, they are suffering because of sin. In fact, the disciples with Jesus had this thought when it came to a blind man from John chapter 9. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi... Who sinned that this man, is it this man or his parents, that this man was born blind? Now listen to Jesus' um, explanation here. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, that statement that Jesus makes is going to be um, prevalent throughout all of our understanding of all of our circumstances. God is involved in everything that we're involved in. And in fact, whether it's suffering, whether it's a difficult circumstance, God is revealing himself, whether it be to us or to others. And so the disciples had that question or that was their explanation of suffering. Because the man sinned or because anyone that suffers must be because of sin. Another way that we try to handle those three questions, those problematic questions, is that we just throw in, well, it is the will of God. It's just the will of God. Now, while that may have some biblical truth, we have to recognize that in everything, God is using us or using anyone that is going through suffering for his purpose, for his will. We may even reference Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. As Joseph was brought before his brothers, says this, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about this day to save many people alive. Or we may refer to Jesus and his suffering according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, when Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So as Jesus was suffering, again, remember his prayer in the garden? Not my will, but thine be done. Every step that Jesus took, even the steps of suffering, he offered up praise, glory, and prayer to God in following him. So while we may answer 
anyone going through suffering. Well, that's just the will of God. We also recognize that it brings us to a place of worship. It brings us to a place of peace. It brings us to a place as Joseph trusted God, as Jesus trusted God. It brings us to a place of trust and rest. And then we, might, we also might say this, well, everyone endures some good and some bad. Everyone endures suffering. We may reference Matthew 5 and 45, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Simply saying that good things and bad things happen to all people. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. See, the psalmist is saying, while we go through this suffering, God is our refuge and we will go through suffering. But then he says this in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. So even while we go through the suffering, See, we want to explain that, that everything is going to work out on our behalf. But the psalmist says here, be still and know that God is God. Joseph trusted God, even though his brothers meant for evil, what God meant for good. Jesus, even though he suffered, he was able to worship and trust God. Not necessarily of course, Jesus did, but we not necessarily knowing all of the plan, all of the purpose, all of the steps. We trust God. And then, of course, we use Romans 8, 28, trying to explain suffering. Everything is going to turn out OK. Or we might even say everything's going to turn out good. Actually, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So God is going to work things out according to his purpose, his good. And we might through that suffer. We might endure hardship. And then there's another statement that we make. There's another reason that we give in order to comprehend these questions about suffering. God, do you allow this? God, if you're a God of love, how can this be? God, did you send this? We might answer this way. If you're good, good things will happen. But if you're bad, bad things are going to happen. Now, folks, that's not biblical at all. As we just looked at several verses, we recognize that, yes, good and bad will happen. We will suffer. But as we Think about suffering biblically. I pray that it brings us to a place of worship and of peace. And that's what we turn to when we turn to Isaiah chapter 45. Now, as we turn to Isaiah or back to Isaiah 45, there will be three truths that we will see come from this text that we are led to trust God. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because throughout scripture, in all of suffering, whether it was the suffering of the people of God in Isaiah, whether it was the suffering of the people of God in Judges, whether it was the suffering of Job, whether it was the suffering of Joseph, whether it was the suffering of Jesus, in all of these episodes of suffering, and we'll look at other episodes in the next couple of weeks, we see an element that God leads everyone to respond with trust. Trust God through it all. Trust God in all of the suffering. In fact, the proverb chapter 3 verse 5 is a proverb we use over and over again to speak of this truth. It says this, trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You see, too often we want, again, we want to understand it all. We want to have it explained. We want to be able to, to comprehend it on our terms, on our level. 
in our way. R.C. Sproul Jr., uh, he says this when it comes to understanding everything in terms of eternity. He says, my inability to think of a good reason why God would do anything or why, why suffering would happen in my life. My inability to think of a good reason why God would do this is zero evidence that there can be no reason why God would do this. And so while we may want to know, God, what is the reason for all of this? God, I need you to explain to me so that I can be okay with it. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And as we see in Isaiah 45, God leads Isaiah as God would lead us to trust him in all aspects, even into suffering. So as we think about embracing suffering biblically, we think about this episode that God leads Isaiah to write. Now, in your Bibles, you may have the title of Isaiah 45 say something like this, Cyrus in the hands of God or Cyrus as an instrument of God. What this means is God uses this king. He's an unbeliever, but God uses Cyrus for his own purposes, his own plan. In verse one, we actually see then the first truth that is involved in every aspect of every life. This includes suffering. This includes joyful times. This includes all circumstances. In all circumstances of life, we recognize this truth. God's hand is in this. Look at verse one of Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Now this word anointed, by the way, we are used to this term when it talks about the Messiah, Jesus, or we are used to this term when it talks about the Redeemer. So when God delivers this message to Isaiah to speak, God is making this very important that I am using Cyrus as my instrument, as my vehicle, if you will, to fulfill my pleasure, my plan. And so as we see Cyrus then being named, called God's anointed, what this means is God is separating Cyrus, setting him apart for his own pleasure or his own, uh, his own purpose. Not only does God separate Cyrus, notice also in verse one, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. So we see that God sets Cyrus apart and he leads him. He draws him, if you will. He controls him, if you will, to his purpose and his plan. And so this gives us an understanding that God's hand is at work leading Cyrus. Cyrus is placed by God to rule. Cyrus is placed by God, if you will, to bring into captivity God's people. When we think of leaders in charge, we might think, well, if, if we could just vote this way or if we could just uh, you know, call this way, if, if, if we could just pray enough, God will, will change things. We understand this in Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So even while the people of God were being oppressed, even though they were held in captivity under Cyrus, it was the hand of God that was at work. And they needed to trust the Lord. Friend, you may be going through an episode of suffering in your life and you may not have the reasons why. There may not be an explanation. In fact, we go through things, sometimes we use this term. This seems senseless. When it doesn't make sense, that is the time that we worship the Savior. When it doesn't make sense, that is the time that we trust God without understanding everything fully and completely. 
We trust God. God's hand was in this episode with Cyrus. Number two, not only was God's hand in this and God's hand is in all of our circumstances. Verse two leads us to a second truth that God's feet have gone before or God has gone on before us to clear our path, if you will, to make straight. Look at verse two. I will go before you. I make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. Now, folks, I hope this gives us peace that knowing that while we do go through some difficult and suffering times, God has gone before us and cleared the path. I like to go and take my bike out into uh, some trails. Uh, we have some parks here in our community, uh, some mountain biking trails. And I like to go and enjoy a ride on those trails. Well, before those trails even existed, there was someone who took chainsaws and weed eaters and, and, and all kinds of tools to create that trail. They went on before me. I just followed and I get to ride that trail. I have a path to follow. God has cleared the way for us. Now, yes, along the way, we might stumble. We might fall. There will be some suffering, but the pathway has been cleared. God has gone on before us. This is what the psalmist had in mind in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Listen, he leads me beside still waters. He goes before. He is in front. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. God goes before us. And we trust him in that. While we suffer, we know that God's hand is in it, calling us to trust him. Jesus, when he went to the cross, he cried out to the Lord, but he trusted him. As the people of God are being held in captivity, they are being called to trust the Lord. In our suffering, we know that God's hand is in our midst. And his feet have gone before us. And then we see a third truth here from verse 3 through 7. Now this third truth is actually going to set the stage for the rest of the sermons regarding embracing suffering biblically. Or recognizing God's sovereignty in the midst of our suffering. These verses are going to help us then cultivate and digest the remainder of these sermons. Starting with verse 3. Notice, I will give you treasures of darkness and hidden, richer, uh, and hidden riches of secret places. That you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. So here is the third and probably the most important truth when it comes to circumstance or suffering. The reason that anything happens is so that the glory of God is revealed. The presence of God is revealed. The plan of God is revealed. Go back to the blind man, John chapter 3. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, is it because of this man's sin that he suffers? Jesus said no. It's so that the glory of God will be on display. It's so that the purposes of God will be fulfilled. In the life here of Cyrus, God is using Cyrus in the life of God's people to carry out his own purposes, God's purposes. And in the midst of that, he is revealing himself to Cyrus. So he makes himself, God makes himself known to unbelievers. And then he also works in the lives of believers. Look at verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect. So now it transitions from God revealing himself to Cyrus to God revealing himself, revealing his purpose, if you will, to his own people. 
I have even called you by your name and have named you, though you have not known me. So even in their disobedience, throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people, right? Especially in Judges. We see God's people turn their eyes to God and then they turn their eyes away from God. They turn their eyes to God and then they turn away from God. And, and, and folks, this is just like us. We do this as well. We turn to God when things get rough, right? And then when things start going our way, we have a tendency to turn away from God. And God, his hand is always in our midst. His hand is always working, right? As we trust the Lord with all of our heart, lean not on our own understanding, right? God is working in our midst. He's making our paths straight. He has gone on before us so that his plan, his pleasure in our lives is revealed. And so as he is calling then his people to know him, even though they don't know him, they haven't been obedient to him. Sometimes we have to allow God's purposes, if you will, without making any, any excuses, right? Sometimes we like to tell people, well, you know, everything's going to work out okay. You know, this shouldn't be happening to you. When God's hand is involved, it is involved and his purposes are being planned out, worked out. Regardless of our circumstance and suffering, we have to trust the Lord. So God reveals himself to unbelievers. He makes himself known to believers. He reveals himself in verse five. I am the Lord and there is no other. Folks, that is a truth that we need to recognize in our suffering. I am the Lord. There is no God besides me. I will gird you though you have not known me. God is going to use unbelievers. He used Pharaoh. He used Cyrus. He used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Paul, right? The apostle Paul. Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. God showed up in the midst of that. His hand was in it. He was before him and he called Paul, right? So we recognize that as God calls us, we worship him as he reveals himself to us. I will gird you though you have not known me, verse six, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. What this does is it simply brings us to a place to worship God and trust God no matter what. And folks, I'm not going to paint this, this quick picture of, of everything is rosy because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Suffering can be overwhelming at times. But through it all, I pray that we learn to trust. And then in verse 7, and so this is where we are going to end today. But from verse 7, it's still hard to recognize that while God is working everything out for his purpose and pleasure, he also works it out in the midst of calamity or suffering. Well, that's what he says in verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. So there's a biblical truth that in the midst of our suffering, we may recognize that God's hand is in it. God's feet have gone before and it's for the purpose that God is glorified. God is revealed. God is known. And I pray that that is a lesson that we all learn. That we'll be able to, at the end of this sermon series, in the midst of our suffering, say and pray to God, God, you know my path because you've prepared it. You know my pain because you are leading me to endure it. You know my suffering as you are leading me and directing me to use it, God, for your purpose. And I do pray that's the lesson that we learn. That the sovereignty of God, when it comes to suffering, works out for the purpose of God. I pray that you will continue with us, whether it is following us 
uh, on our YouTube channel or our, our Facebook page uh, as we do meet back in church next week, May 17th. And I pray that as we gather, we all understand and recognize God's sovereignty in the midst of even suffering. Will you pray with me? Lord, we close today with hearts that are anxious to know you more. God, thank you for revealing yourself through your word. Lead us, Father, in this sermon series to know you more and more each day through every circumstance and situation that we find ourselves in. God, we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.